interesting time. We're going to have a good time. Oh, yeah. gonna have, I'm having a wonderful time. <laughs> Let me know when you guys have speed. So you mean we can't just sit here and talk about our politics yeah. for a while? You can. Okay. You have speed? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll read a short introduction and then we'll go. Okay. Ready? Yeah, ready. Okay. David Broder is the Pulitzer Prize winning national political correspondent for the Washington Post. His twice weekly column is carried by more than 300 newspapers around the world, often referred to as the Dean of uh, the nation's political reporters. He is a familiar face to many PBS viewers through his many appearances on the uh, Wall Street, excuse me, uh, I'll start that part again. He's a familiar face uh, to many PBS viewers on uh, Washington Week in Review. And uh, he's an Illinoisan, a native of Chicago Heights. We're talking to Mr. Broder today in Edwardsville on the occasion of his being named a Lincoln Laureate. Mr. Broder, welcome. Good to see you. I'm very glad to be back. It's wonderful to have you back in Illinois. And uh, I want to talk about uh, your early life in Chicago to get things started. Uh, that's one of the great newspapering towns in this country where uh, things are done pretty much hard knuckles from the politics to the way yeah. politics is covered. So you, uh, you had a great start in that up there, just reading the papers and all. I sure did, and worked on a community paper in Hyde Park when I was going to the University of Chicago, and uh, got a little bit of Chicago politics uh, that way. But you can't have lived in Chicago and not uh, know that uh, politics is the most fascinating and in some ways also the toughest game in town. In your early life, who were some of the early influences for you uh, growing up uh, just before, uh, just in the area around, era around World War II? Well, the first politician that I ever met was Mayor Kelly. He came to my high school, Bloom Township High School, and uh, a bunch of us students were invited to escort him, and uh, he was a charmer. Uh, then later uh, in I got to know Paul Douglas first as a faculty member at the University of Chicago and then as a candidate and as United States Senator. And I also remember hearing Adlai Stevenson uh, speak at a mock United Nations uh, program at the University of Chicago, one of the best speeches I think I ever heard, and it was a throwaway for him with a student audience. What got you interested in politics to begin with? I, you know, I don't know. There was nobody in my family who was ever involved in politics, but it was talked about at the dinner table uh, growing up in those years just before and during World War II. Obviously, there was a lot that was happening in the country and in the world that my parents were very much involved with. So I guess that was probably at dinner table conversations as much as anything. Well, you were, the nation was coming out of the Great Depression at the time. Uh, you were seeing all of the New Deal politics, the policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and uh, the various ways that the country was trying to recover, and that would have been uh, uh, certainly the topic for a lot of different discussions. Yeah, you know, my dad was a dentist in Chicago Heights and it was during the Depression. People didn't have money. Uh, he took care of people whether they could pay him or not. And a lot of uh, the patients w would come with a sort of a barter arrangement. I remember, for example, uh, going out as a kid with my dad to a farm that the Dietfeldt family had and uh, we got that wonderful fresh unpasteurized milk from from them and that was their way of paying for having a dentist that took care of their family. Um, you took uh, degrees in political science at the University of Chicago uh, both at the baccalaureate and master's degree level. Who were some of your influences there? Well, I think probably the person who got me really started on thinking about politics and journalism, there was no journalism school, you couldn't take a journalism course there, but I had a wonderful American history course with a professor named Meredith Wilson, not the music man, but same name, uh, who taught us by exposing us to the original documents 
we didn't have a textbook, but we read the arguments back and forth from revolutionary times on. And it was a great way to learn American history because it rid you of the notion that there was something inevitable about the way this country developed. You really lived those arguments. And because of that, I think I was fascinated by the current arguments in politics, understanding that it's up to every generation to help shape what this country is and what it's going to become. So America is always a work in progress. Exactly. Um, you, uh, you went to the Army, of course. You did a brief stint there, as everyone did pretty much in those days. Your first newspaper in job, tell us about that. Well, I, when I got out of the Army, my wife, I had married while I was in service, and my wife and I uh, both wanted, were looking for newspaper work and wrote to a lot of papers and got an offer from the Bloomington Pantograph, which turned out to be a wonderful break. It's a terrific paper in a wonderful community. And the f people that took us in there not only taught both of us the rudiments of journalism, I'd never had a journalism class and didn't know a thing about what I was doing, but they taught us and uh, became great friends. And it's a wonderful, was a wonderful way to start out. It's still a wonderful paper and a wonderful place. I'm, I'm familiar with it from my own family. This is this is agriculture country in the central Some Illinois. of the best farmland in the world. Oh, exactly. So what were some of the stories you covered? Well, I was on the state staff, worked for uh, Hal Adams, who, when I was in charge of Livingston and Woodford counties, I used to uh, begin the day by getting the in the pink envelopes from the housewives who would write us about the personal items of news and we would type those up and then jump into a company car and head out looking for news which meant checking the courthouse checking the local police uh, the pantograph was always interested in safety on old route 66 so if you came across a wreck on 66 for the, we carried those old heavy speed graphic cameras. I was a terrible photographer. Uh, but if you got a picture of a car wreck, that was a very good day. What, were, what, was the, what, was, what story from those days stands out in your mind? Well, the oddity that stands out in my mind was that uh, it was by chance my introduction to somebody who became very important in all of our lives, Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was then working for General Electric Theater as the television host. There was a GE plant in Bloomington. He'd come by at least once a year, sometimes more often, talk to the executives at the GE plant about the beauties of free enterprise system. And then he'd go up the road to Eureka College and talk to the students. And Eureka, of course, was the county seat of Woodford County, and that was part of my beat. So I started covering Ronald Reagan long before he was running for office. Told him when he was when I was covering his first presidential campaign, I said, "I think I've been hearing your speeches longer than anybody else." And the thing with Reagan, of course, was when he had a line that worked, he never dropped it from the repertory. So there were some lines that I'd heard back in Eureka that were still part of the of the shtick. Did you get a sense at that time that this was a guy bound for bigger, uh, bigger things down the road politically? Well, he was a very glamorous figure and a big shot. And um, I had an aunt uh, who worked in, the, in Hollywood as a drama coach at MGM. So I knew from her conversations, I mean, she knew the Reagans socially and knew that uh, there was a kind of an ambition stirring there. But I couldn't have told you that he was bound to be president. That would have been, uh, you, had been a lot smarter than I was to know that. Jack, let me interrupt you for one minute. Okay. Go ahead and stop tapes for a second. Okay. Let me see a medium shot out of your camera. Okay. Here. Do we know have speed? You were at the Pantograph for a couple of years, but then uh, 1955 finds you in Washington at the Congressional Quarterly. 
that's a big jump from central Illinois to, to the nation's capital. It was, and it wasn't a planned uh, jump. I was trying to see if I could get a job on one of the metropolitan papers here in the Midwest and tried St. Louis and Chicago and Louisville and Milwaukee, all without any success. And uh, we'd had our first child at that point, dropped him off with grandparents and took a week's vacation and tried the same thing on the East Coast, again with no luck. But when I was interviewing at the Washington Post, the city editor said, well, we don't hire people like you, but there's this outfit called Congressional Quarterly, and sometimes they hire people who, he didn't put it quite this way, but the message was, we don't know anything. And I'd never heard of Congressional Quarterly, but I went over there, interviewed, and a few months later they had a job opening and offered me a job. So I went there and worked for five years doing basic uh, Capitol Hill reporting, which turned out to be a great way to to learn my way around Washington, and it was uh, another important step in the education of Dave Broder. You must have gotten a, a real pragmatic look at the way the place actually operated from actually the floor and all the way back into the staff and, and all that. It's And it's very different from what you expect. One of the things that you discover very quickly is that people who have been heroes of yours politically can sometimes be not very pleasant people and people that you always thought maybe you disagreed with can be very wonderful in terms of being helpful to a reporter. Who stands out? In, from, from well, the two senators from Illinois were terrific to me. I mean, both Dirksen and Douglas uh, welcomed me and they and their staffs were more than generous in helping me figure out what was going on. But you need that kind of help because it's a complicated world up there. And uh, as we're seeing even now with the fight over the judgeships, uh, uh, people have one sort of public posture and a, often a very different private negotiating stance. Some of them can be pretty, pretty hard-nosed. Yes. Uh, Bob Michael, the former minority leader in the United States House of Representatives, also from the Peoria area, uh, told me about uh, how politics was back in those days. You could have, you could duke it out on the floor, but at the end of the day, a lot of the guys would get together and go to the speaker's office, have a few bourbons and branch waters, and kind of talk out things. It's a far, far removed from today. Uh, they gave Bob Michael an award that Congress itself voted him. And one of the things that was said about him, which is absolutely accurate, was that having been in a real war, having been on the front lines in the Battle of the Bulge, he knew the difference between war and politics. And he always told his staff was, you know, we are engaged in political debate, but we're not at war with political opposition. And unfortunately, that kind of perspective that he and his generation brought to politics, not, not there nearly as much today. Contrast the two days. Today you have, as we're sitting down to tape this, you have uh, the fight looming over what, what's going to become of Tom DeLay, the uh, House Majority Leader. Uh, the, uh, they've gone both ways on the ethics rules on that. He's a tough customer. There's, there just seems to be a loss of any sense of institutional limits. I mean, the, Bob Michael and his contemporaries understood that beyond any responsibility that they had as Republicans or Democrats. They were leaders of the House of Representatives, and that meant that they had a certain code of behavior toward each other that had to do with the preservation of the dignity and the effectiveness and the working relationships in the House. I'm afraid that that sense of larger responsibilities uh, has really been weakened now, and it makes it far harder to deal with the issues that are before the country. When did it change? 
I think it's been gradual. I think the fact that the Democrats ran the place, the House, for 40 straight years bred a certain arrogance. I think when the Republicans came back and took over again in 95, uh, they were looking for evening the scores. And in some respects, they've become now almost as arrogant in their ways of running the House as the Democrats were after 40 years. Is there something there for today's leaders to, uh, to take notice of and to think that, uh, that uh, we won't always be in charge and maybe we better, maybe we were to back off a little bit? Well, you would hope so, but uh, there doesn't seem to be much sense of self-restraint on, on either side at, at this point. And uh, the frustration level among the members of Congress themselves, many of whom come there with hopes of actually doing something for the country, those who are serious about their work and have more than a mere partisan goal are the, uh, probably as frustrated as the public is with what's going on. I haven't asked you about the presidency, but you've covered every campaign since, what, 1960 and all yes. the conventions? Who stands out? I mean, we, we begin with uh, John F. Kennedy and go all the way up through George W. Bush. Well, they're, they're all, each one of them is different, and each one of them has his own strengths and weaknesses. As a human being, I think probably the person who was least affected by being president was Jerry Ford. I mean, he never expected to be president. It had not been part of his ambition. And he never really changed in the presidency. He was good old Jerry Ford from beginning to end there. Uh, of all of them, I would say probably the, the largest in historical terms uh, was Lyndon Johnson. I mean, he was, he was bigger than life size and with both strengths and weaknesses, but uh, he was a force. And, and we, we know from, from hearing uh, more about the historical record David Beschloss has gone back in, and he's done some wonderful work in going through Johnson's papers and, uh, and the audio recordings that were made yes. in his office. Uh, and you know, we now know that Johnson knew how badly the war was going in Vietnam years before. Yes. Uh, a, tragic, a tragic situation for him, but the country as well. Well, his conversations with his friend and mentor, Senator Russell from Georgia, were stunning to read because he had these deep-seated doubts and this almost premonition that this was going to end badly and in tragedy, and yet he could not bring himself to cut it off. and was so afraid that he'd be labeled as the president who lost a country to the communists that uh, he went down the road knowing that the road was going to end in disaster. Richard Nixon, uh, a, a great figure on the American scene, but deeply flawed. And probably the least likely in terms of personality ever to have chosen politics. I mean, Richard Nixon was so ill at ease in just normal kind of social setting, conversation, trivial things. Uh, he could barely, you know, sort of make small, small talk. And you have to wonder why somebody who obviously very intelligent would have been a great lawyer, did practice law briefly and very successfully, but to choose politics where you have to deal with other people with somebody as uncomfortable in just normal human relations uh, and with such deep neuroses as Nixon. It's a very strange choice of careers. Then, of course, the, uh, the, other, the other Illinoisan we talked about a little earlier, Ronald Reagan, who seemed completely comfortable wherever he went. Totally, totally, and had that wonderful, serene confidence that things were going to work out for the best. and. Remarkably enough, they mostly did. You had a long relationship with him, as you said earlier. You uh, started covering him back in the early 50s when he was out on the speaking tour uh, circuit for General Electric and then on through his uh, two terms in office. His legacy was one that we 
probably wouldn't have expected, uh, you know, knowing him earlier on, that the, uh, the fierce, cold warrior that he was actually ended up, in some ways, helping to orchestrate the end of the Cold War. Exactly, and I think you have to say that his confidence that if we raise the stakes in the arms race with the Soviet Union, that they would have to fold, turned out to be right. He didn't have much company in that assumption when he began, but uh, he had that confidence in his own judgment. You never expect to uh, cover something like the end of the Cold War through the presidency and, and national politics. And, and as it takes place, do you have a sense of the history as it's being made? I happened to be in Berlin about a week after the wall came down uh, for a conference that the Aspen Institute had scheduled by chance at that, that moment. And uh, it was remarkable. I mean, the first of the East Germans were beginning to come into Berlin to meet, meet family members and friends that they'd been cut off from for a generation. And the emotions were so high in that city at that time, it was beyond a celebration. It was, it was extraordinary. We've talked a little bit about how politics has changed over the years, but the role of the journalist and the job of the journalist over the years has changed uh, as well. There have been sea changes. Uh, you started out in newspapering where you had a couple editions a day maybe. Now we have the 24-hour news cycle, and it's a, it's a monster that's constantly having to be fed. Um, how, what, what changes, what observations would you make about, uh, about the role of the, the journalist in today's society? As well, the speed factor has become much larger. I mean, whether you're working for a newspaper or anybody now, you're still feeding that website, at, which means that Getting it out fast has probably never been more important. You pay a price in terms of the depth of reporting, although I'm happy to say that Washington Post and a few other places, they still will invest the time and effort to really dig into important stories. But overall, I think the country is well served by the press these days. It, wherever you live, in addition to your local media, you've got access to three national newspapers that are really very good newspapers, The Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. You've got all of the resources of public radio and the cable systems. You have the Internet now. And what I find is my reporting is that you go into a community of any size anywhere in the country now, and there are people self-selected who are every bit as tuned in, well-informed on public affairs as anybody you would meet at one of the West Coast, or excuse me, one of the Washington or East Coast think tanks. They get it. Over the years, there's been a lot of cynicism about the role of the contemporary press. Um, we've just written out the Jason Blair scandal at the New York Times, and there have been a number of others. You have also heard of uh, the situation where uh, columnists were being paid by government sources to go out and push certain lines of um, advocate for certain things. Um, is this a good time to be in the press in this country? Well, we've had some real black eyes. I mean, the, what happened at our paper 12 years ago or 15 years ago with Janet Cook, uh, who concocted a story about a three-year-old being shot up with heroin that turned out to be fiction and what happened with the Times with Jason Blair and the U USA Today and so on. All of, every time one of those things happens, it hurts all of us uh, uh, there. I still think that there's a lot of good journalism being practiced, but we can't take our credibility for granted. We have to prove it every day by what we do. And that's the challenge, I think, for all of us in the business. Does David Broder have a certain set of rules that you apply to uh, the, uh, your conduct, your reporting, uh, uh, the way that you, uh, when you sit down, for example, in Washington Week in Review, 
uh, are you there to report the story as you saw it, or are you, are you there to put your own particular uh, uh, brand of commentary on it? My work has been 99% reporting. Uh, there is some analysis that goes into writing columns, but I don't think it's particularly driven by ideology. Um, and I think that's true of most of my colleagues. The, uh, I know it's hard to just assert this and expect to have people believe it, but the reality is that I've covered politics now for a long time with many of the same people, and I don't know how any of them voted in any election. I think if they were sitting in this chair, any of them would say, I don't know how Broder votes. That's not what we talk talk about. I think we're much more tuned to being spectators and reporters than we are to being advocates. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of course, the, of a book not too long ago that Jim Fallows wrote called Breaking the News. And he wrote a lot about what was then the emerging punditocracy, the people who came on to a lot of the talk shows. And a lot of those shows turned into mud wrestling matches almost. You never got into that kind of thing. You're not required to, to, to become one of the, the performing animals. No, I, I, did, I did John McLaughlin's program one time as a favor to my friend Jack Germond, and it was worse than I expected, and I said, Jack, never again, and it was very, very easy to say no. When you sit down and, and, and do, the, uh, do Washington Week in Review, what are the kinds of things you, you want to bring to the table to let people know about how, uh, how policy is emerging in this country and how the politics of it all plays out? Well, the wonderful thing about that program is that you're sitting there with people who have really been covering the stories, the stories and uh, there's no effort to sort of show each other up. It really is a, a setting where you can try to expound as much as time allows what you think has been taking place in important stories. And the moderators over the years uh, that I've worked with there, from Paul Duke right down to Gwen Eiffel now, have been very good about keeping that tone on that program. As someone who works in public television, I'm curious about uh, how you consider the important, what, what do you consider to be the importance of that medium or that, that, uh, that media pipeline in today's, in today's uh, media? Well, I don't know the size of the audience, but I do know something about the devotion that people have to programs like Washington Week, because when you travel, particularly covering politics, you're just constantly meeting people who say, I've watched, I've seen you on this program, or I've watched that, and it's really a good program. And it's the, the program, it's not the, the individuals, and uh, so it's very important. I have to say, I have to say, I'm personally addicted to, to National Public Radio. I think they do a terrific job of picking up stories that I don't hear anywhere else. I think the thing that's interesting about that, I, I had an opportunity not long ago to sit in on a meeting at the University of Chicago where some NPR officials were, and I had no idea as to how much they had expanded their already uh, large uh, number of bureaus around the world. It's probably now the largest radio network or media network in the world. They've got people in the right places, and the editors have a very good sense about putting on stories that that are significant but tend to be overlooked elder places. What about that? Is, 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 as, as someone who has practiced his craft out of Washington and but has a sense of, obviously, of how the global media uh, functions, are we getting a good view of the world in this country? Are we... Are, do we know as much about the world through our own media as we should? We heard a lot, of course, about uh, South Asia after the tsunami disaster uh, a few months ago, but are we getting the kind of information we need? Probably not. Uh, the, certainly the television net, commercial television networks have cut back on their international reporting, um, but uh, uh, my work has been mostly domestic, and I don't consider myself an expert or a good critic of, of international reporting. 
in today's world at the Washington Post, uh, what's the role for good old fashioned, what they call shoe leather journalism? Well, we practice that assiduously in our political reporting at the Washington Post. I mean, literally. We are out walking precincts, knocking on people's doors, uh, talking to folks in their own homes, <clears throat> and asking them, what's on your mind? How do things look to you? How is our country doing? How is the president doing? What do you think about Congress and so on? It's hard work, but you learn more that way than from any other kind of reporting that I've ever come across. What's the next story that you'd like to go out and cover? <laughs> Whatever is that is, comes up next. I'm looking forward and in a way to the 2008 presidential campaign. I have no idea who will be running, but I think that because there we'll, will be new candidates on both sides, it should be an interesting campaign. But we've got a lot of business to do in Washington between now and then with energy legislation, with likely vacancies on the Supreme Court. We've got a heavy agenda of interesting stories coming up in Washington. This is going to be a time, a yeasty time in, in journalism with, with all of those issues to be decided. I think that's right. Um, you obviously will have an opportunity to talk to a lot of young journalists in training as they come up through the ranks. You interns, I'm sure you make appearances on college campuses much like you're doing today. Why would you advise them to go into this line of work? Well, I think you have to be honest with, with young people and say none of us know what form of journalism the American people are going to want in the coming decades. Uh, there are many more options now than was the case when I was starting in the business. But I do think there is still a hunger for information and a hunger for news. And if you're prepared to work at it, it's still a wonderfully rewarding life. I mean, where else would you get paid to be a spectator at these amazing events? <laughs> Well, that leads me to my next question. For you personally, after such a, a long and distinguished career uh, in journalism, what's been the most satisfying part about it for you personally? I think probably watching now two generations of politicians try to struggle with the challenge of governing this country. Uh, I find some of the most impressive people not in Washington, but in state capitals, city halls, um, and uh, I'm squishy soft on politicians, and I enjoy their company. I really have a great admiration for people who are willing to gamble with their reputations, put their names on the ballot, invite the public for whatever reason to judge them as compared to somebody else. Most of us would run like hell the other direction to avoid being in that situation. So I admire the politicians who are willing to do it. We talked a bit earlier in this interview about democracy and this country being a work in progress. Are you optimistic about that work in progress? I think the quality of the people in the system has never been higher. I think there's some real problems in the system itself, particularly now with the party balance as close as it is and the seeming lack of restraint on what it takes to win a fight, whether it's uh, an election campaign or a legislative battle in the floor of the House of Representatives. I never thought I would see a roll call held open on the floor of the House of Representatives for three hours, as happened with the Medicare prescription drug bill. I never thought I'd see a member of the United States, of the President's cabinet out lobbying personally on the floor of the House of Representatives. There is a kind of a sense that there are no limits anymore that uh, is worrisome. But the American people have such good sense. They rarely make a serious mistake. And I think we will impose on our politicians the kind of standards that they seem to have forgotten themselves. David Broder, thanks very much. Thank you. Congratulations on your uh, becoming a Lincoln Laureate. Thank you. We need to roll off a few more seconds of time here for uh, credits um, and the like.
Mike, go ahead. And do but I'm going to I'm going to ask another question or two Mike. about Paul Simon. Good. Right? Let's do that. And I think I need to say. Uh, I think I need to ask one question over. I think I said David Beslosh, and I know darn better. <laughs> I know much. He was here last year for this, and I had a wonderful time yeah. sitting down with him. So that was that was a, that was my fault there. But, uh, was there anything that I didn't ask about that? Uh, no, I thought you, you, you got me talking a lot more than I know. <laughs> well, it was fun. Hey, Raj. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about uh, Paul Simon. Okay. And I'll also, I don't know if we need him here for this or not, but I need to recut one of my questions. Okay. Because I, uh, well, let's, uh, we can do each one of them. We can do both of them. Okay. All right. How much time do we have on our tapes, gentlemen? 35. Okay. We're in good shape, I think. Okay. And we're still rolling, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's cool. just go ahead. All right. Well, uh, we are rolling still. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about uh, uh, the late Paul Simon. Uh, we're, as I said, working on a documentary on his life. Uh, you had the opportunity to cover him for a good many years while he was on Capitol Hill in a number of capacities. Uh, what stands out most about Paul? His independence. Uh, he made up his own mind and was f fearless about expressing it. And I expect over the course of a career aggravated more people who thought, well, I can't understand why Paul would be doing this or that. I'm thinking of things like his support for the balanced budget amendment, which offended a lot of liberals, and his strong advocacy, for example, of uh, foreign aid programs, which bothered a lot of conservatives here in Il Illinois and but he was absolutely always his own mer man. That balanced budget act amendment, uh, I want to ask a little bit more about that. Paul was, um, Paul came out of a strong uh, Lutheran background. I remember his uh, I know uh, I know a fellow that used to deliver papers to Paul's dad, uh, Reverend Simon, and the guy told me, he said, well, you know, it used to be we would get uh, a little bit of change, keep the change, kid, when you got the paper. Yeah. Reverend Simon always wanted to count the change and get it, get it all back. <laughs> uh, he was, would you call him a pay-as-you-go kind of politician? Absolutely. And it was, it was more than an economic theory to him. I think it was a sense that the only proper life is a disciplined life and the only proper government is one which disciplines itself at least to the respect of paying for its own bills. Why did that, uh, why haven't we actually achieved that yet? Why is it, <laughs> why is it such a tough stuff? Because it is so much more pleasant to spend money than to raise taxes. Um, was he uh, I don't think you could ever say that he was uh, naive. He had a pretty good sense of uh, pretty good sense of what was possible and what wasn't. But he really fought for that. Absolutely, no. But he was a real politician. I mean, anybody who thought that this was some sort of a foolish idealist uh, who didn't live in the real world did not know Paul Simon. He was a very effective and skillful politician. And uh, he never forgot that he was a politician, uh, worked his constituencies, and worked his issues. Uh, he was not interested in simply sort of hanging a position out there for advertising that is a, as, a, as a slogan. He wanted to make policy. He wanted to see change take place. He told me uh, on more than one occasion, he said, well, I wasn't really interested about something getting in the headlines. I just wanted to know if something, that something I was doing could actually make a difference. And whether that was in, in the Illinois State House getting no passing zone signs put up along the state highways or getting literacy programs done in Capitol Hill. Yes. And he did make a difference. He made a huge difference. I mean, um, my f my dad was a great admirer of his back when he was in the legislature working with people like Tony Scariano and uh, on, you know, nothing harder than being a reformer in the Illinois legislature. 
and yet they they really made a difference. Well, now, Paul came in in, what, 1955, around about, yeah, 1955, and uh, we have an interesting history in, in Illinois politics with Paul Powell and the shoe boxes. And he, um, you didn't really do, did you do any state house reporting? Not much. Time? Okay. But how would you describe the, the milieu of, of that era in Illinois politics? Well, it was a get-along, go-along, uh, and often pay your way kind of kind of uh, kind of politics I mean the the stories that you heard about about uh, the State House were not uh, edifying stories and he knew exactly what that environment was but he also knew that it needed to change and he was willing to take it on he had good allies in that uh, fight but if he hadn't been in the fight it never would have worked and that fight uh, cost him dearly in a lot of respects. When that Harper's Magazine ad, uh, story came out in 1964, a study in corruption about the Illinois legislature, he, he was given the Benedict Arnold Award by some of his colleagues. Yes. Uh, are we going to remember Paul as, a, as one of those profiles in courage? Well, he certainly had the profile in courage, and I, I hope that the people coming along in Illinois politics uh, understand what a special category he was in. Uh, I think they, they do, uh, but uh, he was an inspirational person, and happily he left a lot of that inspiration behind in the words that he wrote. I mean, it wasn't just that he was an activist and an effective politician. He also really left a legacy in terms of his writing on which people can draw. And that was, you, you mentioned his writing. Uh, Paul had something like 20 books or more to his credit. He even had one come out after his life, 52 Ways to Make a Difference or Improve Your Life. Uh, we don't have too many citizens, scholar politicians like that anymore. No, and uh, probably Selfishly, I would say it means that we ought to be looking more to journalists uh, for <laughs> for politicians. But there weren't very many journalists with his guts, and certainly not many politicians with his skills. Well, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to ask that one question over again. Okay. Um, Michael Beschloss, when he was working on the, uh, let's see, we're talking about Lyndon Johnson. One of the things that comes out through Michael Beschloss's own work in, in terms of the, the Johnson presidency and going back through all the audio tapes, you, you sense Johnson's anguish over how badly that war is going and how little he really had politically invested in it to begin with. But at the same time, he couldn't get away from it. It was like the Jefferson with the slavery. You had a wolf by the ears. Yes, exactly. You don't need my response no. again. I good. think I got it there. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, thank good. you so much. I enjoyed it. Really it was good it. to see you. Um,